gleich biegen wir ab in quasi in die Wüste. Ähm, wir treffen uns jetzt mit Brandon Cummings. Er gehört zu den Menschen, die den Eisbären auf die Liste der bedrohten Tierarten gepackt haben. Und jetzt hat er sich den Joshua Tree verschrieben. Also schon ein Mann, der ziemlich genau weiß, was er macht. Und der wird uns jetzt erklären, was es mit diesem Baum auf sich hat und warum das alles miteinander zusammenhängt. There he is. There he is. Oh great. Ich stelle mich einfach mal hier hin. Hi, Brent. Nice to meet you. Yeah. We, we, we can walk there, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, perfect. I, I take my jacket, yeah. So, this is a young Joshua tree. This one. That I planted a few years ago, or a while ago. Um, and it's... Um, a few years ago? It, it's young, yeah. They grow really slowly. So, about um, three centimeters a year. And oh. I can explain when we settle in. Sure. Um, sort of the life history. Yeah. But that's there so the rabbits don't eat them because... Um, From a Joshua tree and seed to a Joshua tree, you know, fewer than one in a thousand sprout and su survive. If you look at Joshua trees, they look abundant and pretty healthy. And it's hard to immediately think of them as being absolutely endangered. You know, and, and one of the things that along those lines, you know, 15 years ago, I did... Um, the work to get polar bears protected as a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And I did that while living here. And I knew Joshua trees, there were studies showing there were problems with them, there were lots of fires and other issues, but it, it, it's hard for it to feel like they're truly endangered when you see them around you. One thing to remember, when you look at these trees here, they were recruited into the population under a climate that no longer exists. You know, it was on average a little over one degree C cooler. And so there are very, very few um, new trees entering the population. As these trees grow old and die, um, they won't be replaced. So in other words, if we could snap our fingers and stop global warming at current levels, no more warming, just keep it at the level it is now. As the older trees age and die off and the current young trees grow up to replace them, the area where the trees are is cut in half. So that's the best case scenario. And obviously you can't snap your fingers no. and end climate change um, right now. But you know, the people aren't interested in trees. They just want to have the cute, I don't know, the cups of polar bears. I think it's easier to save them than the Joshua tree. Or what do you think? It's easier to get people to care about polar bears than lots of other species threatened by climate change. You know, some of the species we work on to protect our, you know, insects. Like, you know, there's flies and spiders that live only on glaciers. As the glaciers melt, those species will go extinct. It's hard to get the public to care about them. They clearly care about polar bears. What is it for a house? What is one? Um, this is a little cabin um, that a, a friend of ours owned and um, when she died, we had arranged to get it when she died, just because we didn't want this area to get developed or a yes. giant house to be put in. Yes. And so we let um, friends and guests come and stay here. How do you feel about that this tree might be going extinct at the end of the century? It's... Like, I can read the science, I can do an analysis of, of, you know, what's projected for it, and then I can pay attention to world politics and see how, even when politicians say that they care about climate change, they continue to approve new uh, oil drilling, new, new gas-powered power plants, new pipelines, you know, our political system is way, moving way too slow to address climate change. And it's very easy to become, you know, pessimistic or fatalistic that it's, it's too late. But 
you know, if we if enough people do the right thing and we get our political system pointed in the right direction, there's hope to change to save Joshua trees. You know, in a in a in a, on some level, like even though more people are aware of the plight of the polar bear, it's it's harder for me to visualize a future where we still have polar bears in the wild. You know, when you think through it logically, the amount of warming that's already baked into the system, you know, the climate inertia, the amount of sea ice that we're losing rapidly um, is, there's a very high chance, more likely than not, that all polar bears are going to disappear from the wild. They're going to starve. Um, this is something what will happen, yeah? Most likely. You know, if climate, if society gets turns things around in the next decade, maybe we can avoid it, and polar bears in the high Arctic will still persist. Um, and then in the decades following, we stabilize the climate, and it starts to cool, and then they can expand back out. But if we lose polar bears in the wild, we'll still have polar bears, the animal, in a zoo, but that's not the same. You know, an animal in the zoo is not the same as an animal living out in the wild, and a polar bear. It's much harder for a polar to go from a polar bear in a zoo to life in the wild than it is to go from a seed that I, you know, sprout in my garden to planting it in the soil and nurturing it and protecting it and eventually getting another Joshua tree. Isn't it ridiculous that we are we are destroying this species? living that far away in, in, in parts of the world we can't exist. I came here from Europe with, a, with an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if it's right or wrong to do that. Coming to this place to see the tree, um, speaking with you, mm -hmm. but in the end I came here by airplane. I, I think... I came by car here from Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, exactly. I, I, I had lunch there. Mm -hmm. At one of these uh, mm -hmm. stores, mm -hmm. which are shining to the to the to the stars. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that I think is always important is separating our individual actions from the political actions that are really causing the climate crisis. We're going to lose polar bears. We're going to lose Joshua trees. We're going to lose coral reefs. We're going to lose the Amazon and tropical forests. And even if we as a species survive, we're going to inhabit a much, much more diminished planet. What about those um, hunting licenses you can get on these auctions? Mm -hmm. That you can hunt polar bears, for example, you know, we can buy... Uh... Yeah, a week or so ago I noticed that the trophy hunting group uh, Safari Club was auctioning out a polar bear hunt. In Las uh, Vegas. In Las Vegas. Yes. And Isn't it crazy? Uh, yes. It, it's. We have such a twisted relationship with, with big wildlife where there's this desire, like I can totally understand the desire to want to interact, you know, you know, if that ground squirrel comes up to me, you look at it and you feel like you're having a connection, but interaction doesn't require killing it to have full interaction. No, I don't want to shoot it and take it back home and put it on my, yeah. I don't know where. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pathological. You know, catching a fish to eat it is a very different relationship with wildlife than shooting a lion or polar bear to put its head above your fireplace. Um, and, you know, I would condemn no one for catching an, a fish to feed their family versus the trophy hunter, I just cannot comprehend, you know, the thought processes, the psychology that compels them to do so. Canada. Why Canada is allowing it? Most of the world's polar bears are in Canada. About two thirds of the world's polar bears are in Canada. And Canada is the only one of the Arctic nations that commercializes polar bears, turns them from wildlife to commodity and uh, allows the trophy hunting of them as well as the sale of polar bear rugs. You know, partly it's the influence, the political power of the hunting lobby. Um, one other dynamic at play in Canada, um, which is more complex, is the relationship between uh, trophy hunters and native communities. So 
Um, in many of the northern communities in Canada, the indigenous communities, there's very little economic development. And so to provide political cover for trophy hunting, Canada will run the permits through the native villages and say, you have the right to, to profit off of the trophy hunting of a polar bear. And um, so a white hunter from the US or from Europe or wherever comes in, yeah. shoots the polar bear, the, the native village gets a little bit of money off of it. And so Canada then is able to argue you know, this we're doing is, something good. We're doing something good by killing polar bears. Are they? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's true. Unfortunately. Ich meine, das wird's relativ bald nicht mehr geben. Ich glaube, da brauchen wir uns nichts vorzumachen. Dieser Baum wird aussterben. Diese Jahrhunderte alten Bäume, die hier stehen, werden einfach aussterben. Irre. Ich weiß nicht warum, aber seit ich die Geschichte von diesem Baum kenne, habe ich das Gefühl, ich würde vor einem toten Elefanten stehen. Es hat für mich die gleiche Emotion mittlerweile, als wäre es ein totes Tier. Es ist einfach auch ein Lebewesen. Ich weiß nicht, warum mich das so mitnimmt. Wie alt war der? 300 Jahre? Thank you so much for watching my documentary. I'm Michael and I want to raise a million dollars to save the polar bears. You know why? If the polar bears disappear one day, we will disappear either. So there is still work. And yeah, you can help us to keep these animals on this planet. Just go to my site, truth-unscripted.com and make a little donation of $2.50 to save the bears, to save this planet, to save us. And please subscribe my channel, Truth Unscripted, on YouTube. Um, we will make more documentaries for you. We will try to explain you the world with a little bit of fun. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing my work.